Hello, Glenn. Hi, hey, Glenn. How's it going, guys? I guess you you were busy today, eh? Hey, it's a cool day today. Yes. Twenty four below overnight. Eighteen uh, below this morning. Seven below in the house. Ooh. Cool. <laughs> Yeah, it was kind of weird, right? How it was, uh, at least down here it was warm, hot one day, then a snowstorm, then it was nice weather, then it's all of a sudden very cold. So- That's what's happening all the time now is uh, what used to be uh, two, three weeks cold, then a, a week or so off the cold, then two, three weeks of cold again. Now it's almost day to day. One day hot, one day cold. One day hot, one day cold. One day hot, two days cold. Yep. It looks like some type of manipulation. What would make you think that I was busy today? The phone. You tried calling before, about an hour ago. Ah, okay. Yeah. I was outside. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I was just talking with... Uh, with Dana before we were looking at the county, Flint County? Flint, Michigan. In Michigan, yeah, and, and looking at the symptoms that they, yeah. they're saying people will get from lead and I don't know how it relates to all of uh, what we've discussed yeah. regarding electromagnetism and everything. What do you think? Alex Ellis told me to... Uh, basically act as their laboratory and uh, test out everything they asked me to do in order to know the answers before the real problem returns, which basically they got to be talking about the soup. There are lakes in northern Ontario that have doubled their size over the last month or so. How does a lake double its size when there's no water running into it that has increased on the surface? Something is happening underground, and it could be what's pushing against the wall, the Michigan Northern Peninsula or something and backing up water underground so that it looks for escape hatches, finds these lakes, bubble up like a volcano, and the lake expands. Animals, uh, elk and uh, caribou and stuff like that are having to uh, leave the marsh lands that they frequent for as long as anybody remembers, and they're being pushed further and further away from the center. Since the lake is expanding on all sides, not a lake, many lakes. So that's one hint of things to come. The fact the cell wants me to be the guinea pig and report back on, you know, how cold it is in the the house. Seven below was the coldest in the house that we've had because we don't have to deal with uh, wind or rain or freezing rain in the house, but it basically is not unlike a cave. I use five blankets now, so, and I wear boots to bed. I've got some uh, caribou skin boots with uh, fur lining inside type of thing. And I put those on when I go to bed. I guess you could use some, like, uh, heated insoles. Uh, We're pretty close to the end of the worst part, Jared. It's uh, going into March. If it's going to be cold, it'll be around zero. So that's not a problem. Zero outside means the house will be at about five above. 
What problems do you think you'll have in the coming months? I think it's just a warm up. That's the problem, is I don't know what problems exist. Certainly, keeping a fire going requires a lot of picking up branches outside that fell out of trees and died and stuff like that, rather than cutting wood, because you're kind of restricted in a barbecue as to the size of the wood you use and stuff like that. But uh, I would say the most important thing for people to think about is where's their water coming from? Is their water coming from a well which they can send a pail down and, and bring up some water in a pail, or do they depend solely on electrical contact to start a pump that runs the water up into your taps, indoor plumbing type of thing. But without water, you're dead. Second thing that you have to start looking at is freeze-dried foods, freeze-dried vegetables, freeze-dried fruit, because they have a 20-year lifespan. Then you have to look at sanitation. If the plumbing is not working, what are you going to do? If it's cold and the plumbing works, you have to modify how you use the toilet by not throwing any paper down the toilet. Because the paper, rather than the excrement, is what blocks up sewage lines or septic tank lines. So that's important. If you're going to be doing it outside, you should find a place where you could put an old toilet seat. If you have a toilet at home and the seat is, you know, 15, 20 years old, take it off, get a new one, put on that toilet, then set yourself up someplace where you would have a certain amount of privacy over a hole outside. These are the things that are all obligatory to this caveman-style lifestyle. Consider your house to be a cave rather than a house. It'll give you protection from wind and rain, and to a certain extent, the cold. Back to base. What else? Uh, batteries. You always make sure you have a portable radio. The Red Cross also sell one that gives you those broadcasted warnings of hurricanes and tornadoes and floods and stuff. But what I've found is that uh, if they want to kill you, what they do is they rig the radio so that when something does occur, um, what's supposed to happen is your dial automatically moves to the station that will give you the weather and problems that occur that way on the radio. But what I've found, and this is in two radios that I've tried, one was from the Red Cross, another one was just regular radio that I bought in a store. They move off the station, so you're not getting the sound, you're not getting the news, and there's no manual way on those radios to turn a button like you had on old radios and do it manually. They're all automated. So keep that in mind. What else? Uh, if you have animals, be prepared to allow them in the house. <laughs> if they don't have a barn, like I've uh, basically turned this house into a cat sanctuary and moved the goats into the garage and... 
the uh, chickens into the kitten run so that they're all within a short distance of the house that I don't have to go back to the barn or whatever because what's not a problem under normal circumstances would become a problem if there was three or four feet of water on the ground between me and there. What else? If you uh, have a neighbor that has... uh, electricity and they're at a higher level than you for their single family dwelling, then you may want to be sure you have long extension cords to uh, run to your house and at least get something working. Remember that water pumps that run water into your house usually require a stronger electrical charge to start them up. And when they stop, again, when it's time when you've used water and you want to start it up again, you have to have sufficient amperage and size of extension. You can't buy the ordinary extension that you would normally use in the house or a garden, you have to get a much uh, lower number. They come in numbers. Most of the ones that are sold in hardwares are 14, no good, 12, no good, 10, yeah, 10 is basically what you should be looking for, and 3, something like that. That's if you have somebody you could send an extension cord over to. And don't forget, extension cords are uh, normally no longer than 100 feet. So if they're 200 feet away, you need two of them. And that's basically to keep the power in the electrical charge at a level where it can turn the starter on. A pump or almost anything else uses practically no electricity just to run. It's the on and off that's the problem. Make sure you have boots that are waterproof and not summer boots because the water is pretty cold. What about your pipes and stuff if the water is not circulating through there? The one thing you should do is the tap furthest away from where the water comes in should be left on, not pouring, but, you know, about a pencil size of water running out. And, uh, of course, if it's in the bathroom, you do it in the bathtub, but you don't put the plug in unless you need water (laughs) because then it'll overflow. You leave the plug out, let the water run, and that means that all of the other taps that are closer to where the water comes in will not freeze. But you have to have electricity of some kind for that possibility or your pump won't run. Now... We're on the verge of a change in technology, and solar power doesn't require your thieving electrical company to uh, charge you whatever they want for power. And if they want to steal your house, they make up a big bill of $17,000 as if you had used that electricity because what they want to do is when you die, put a lien on your property, and the lawyers will give them the property. Even if you never used any of their electricity beyond having it, they can steal your property. And if they're selling the insurance company to some idiots who are going to buy shares in it, they want to tell the idiots that they're making a lot of money So they overcharge everybody. 
when uh, Ontario wanted to set up a power grid beyond its own region up in Hudson's Bay and bring power down and stuff like that. They had a, an election, and the people of Ontario said, yeah, we'll give you permission to spend tax money to build an electrical system, an electrical grid to the north, because once it's paid for, then distribution is all there will be, and we'll have the cheapest electricity in the world. What did the hydro do? They went ahead, they built the whole thing, and once it was all built, they raised the prices on everybody. I was being charged for electricity here, being alone, still being charged for electricity at a rate now higher than the mortgage. So everybody thinks of buying a house and the mortgage is going to be the most expensive thing. The crooks are called bureaucrats. They work in government. Why do you think Trump is having so many problems with leaks of information and judges who don't want to do what he's ordered to do and all of that stuff? Because politicians don't run the show. That's why bureaucrats took over in 1789 when they had the French Revolution and chopped the heads off the monarchs. Well, now's the time to chop the heads off the bureaucrats and give power back to the people. So creation will stand by while the idiots that run the country from their hiding place have decided that the idiots called bureaucrat crooks that they've employed for a while are no longer viable for a a change in uh, purpose. And the purpose of life in the future will be space exploration. So everybody that's been genetically engineered, socially engineered, and electromagnetically connected so that they will do what they've been programmed to do, no longer have the right program. And as with many times in the past history, it's come time to declare their shelf life as expired, take them off the shelf and put something different in its place. That's why you now have migrants coming out of the Middle East. They've got another 12 million in Syria they're waiting to travel. They've been programmed differently. And all of the people who have been programmed as bureaucrats before were bombed to hell by their own government. And All of the ones the U.N. picks out for travel to North America have been programmed to work for them, for the U.N. Now, is it the person that arrives that has a program and once they die, that's it? No, it's the one that arrives carries the original program from the lab but passes it on, and it gets passed on to four generations. So you could have a bureaucrat sitting in an office in Ottawa who's completely programmed, but the programming was done by their great-grandmother or done to their great-grandmother and then passed on to her children, her children's children, and her children's children's children. But they have the program. Four generations is almost 100 years. So every 20 years they give birth. Could you um, go into a little bit more detail about like what the program is and how it comes out? Well, well, you don't have to have very extensive knowledge. Think of the Kentucky Derby. Now, are the horses that are running in the Kentucky Derby 
today the first horses to be genetically engineered. No, they are the offspring of the offspring of the offspring. Genetic engineering is a process that over time changes bit by bit the animal in question, whether it's cats, dogs, horses, sheep, cows, bulls, whatever, pigs. Their genetic makeup is not different from a human being. It's just located in different places, and they have a heart, they have a brain, they have lungs, they have muscles, they have skin, they have, they have everything that human beings have. So the concept that human beings are not being genetically engineered is stupid. Human beings were genetically engineered before the Ice Age. And that was, the Ice Age began in 24,000 B.C. And that's what gave the people then the idea, hey, we could go to space. All we have to do is find the answer to this, that, 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 that. And somebody said, whoa, whoa, we don't have enough people to find the answers. Okay, let's go into hiding. Let's shut down what we did, and let's start feeding out information and start up genetic engineering. So they went into hiding 24,000 B.C. off of Antarctica or under Antarctica. And while in hiding, they prepared to put human beings back in circulation that had been genetically engineered to what they needed at that time. Not to work on a space program, that's not started yet. So at about halfway through the Ice Age, about 8,000 years later, which would make it about 16,000 B.C., they began to put out people. See how they survive without any of the knowledge we have, they said. And people lived in caves and survived. And then they said, okay, let's feed them some information through a group we'll call priests for all intents and purposes. Let's feed them little bits of information so they can start down the journey. And let's over time, build a team of genetic engineers who nobody would suspect are doing that. And everybody always looks to the guy in charge, and therefore in those days they would look to the priest and say, well, if the priest has more knowledge than we have, he must be the one doing the genetic engineering. But what was in fact going on is the priest was being infiltrated. And everything he learned, that infiltrator was given the task of filing the information and storing it in a place where the priest could have access to it. So they built churches, and a woman came in to do the laundry. And the woman doing the laundry was, in fact, genetically engineered to begin the process of bureaucracy. Take orders from the priest. Take the documents from the priest. File them, give it to him when he needs it. Because one day he's going to die. And nobody knows but you who are doing the filing what's in the files, and he can't take it with him. So every time a priest died, they'd steal the files and put it in a central place. And that spread out throughout the entire world. All of the knowledge got put in a special place 
by those people who were assigned the task of doing the cleaning and the garbage removal and the filing and all of that stuff. And nobody ever suspected, not even themselves, could suspect that they were part of a bigger group. Every time a prostitute slept with a man, the information that she got from her client was passed on to a central filing system. So they knew what all of the powerful people wanted and did and whatever. All that information into the knowledge bank. And they had figured out that it would take approximately 7 to 8 billion people on the planet before they would have in their hands the answers to all the questions they needed to travel in space. Who in the world is in a position to do that to the most powerful religious people on earth? Nuns. Why is a nun called N-U-N and the United Nations is U-N? Who owns the United Nations but the nun? Who owns the media but the nun? How do they get to own it all? Because they have the knowledge. They know what's going to happen before it happens. And with the knowledge comes the money. So they set up a system where they can steal money from the average person called a stock exchange. And they know when the bears are going to win, and they know everything about everybody. And they have implanted little labs called cloisters around the world so that when morality said you don't have babies out of wedlock and you were pregnant, you were taken there and your baby was taken out of you and you were disposed of or the baby was disposed of. You would be turned into a prostitute that could make money for them. That's what they wanted, male or female. How do you think condoms came along? Busy prostitutes don't have time to go report back to the doctor in the morning that they slept with the uh, heart surgeon, the chief of the heart surgery hospital last night. But they can send a condom and receive 100 bucks. And if they get condoms of male semen off of Semen, they get them from all over the world if they establish themselves along a waterfront such as Cairo, New York, London, Paris, Marseille, France, along the Mediterranean, whatever. So they collect semen from semen to get all the data about races. And then they latch themselves on to things like prisons. And when you have a prison, well, you know this man here murdered. So did this one. So did that one. So did that one. That one didn't leave him out. Okay, now you got a whole stream of murderers. You get their semen and you go do the genetic research to find out what do they have in common. And you get to find out. This is the murderer's gene, or this is the baseball player's gene, like Babe Ruth, or this is the golfer's gene. All you got to have is a whole bunch of experts at one particular task, and they'll have a common gene. And you put those in a bottle, and then you inseminate your nuns, not When they first come in, they don't know what's going to happen when they first come in. But along the way, if they want to be promoted, hey, you got to be married to Jesus. 
So lie down here, have a drink of vodka, and we'll be back with a specialist whose job it is to artificially inseminate. Do you get the process? Yeah. Four generations for each one. I always look at it like if you walked into a bar and you saw all the bottles. That's scotch from Scotland. That's scotch from the U.S. That's scotch from Canada. That's, you know. So what do you want? You want scotch? Tell me how defined you want that scotch to be. You want it to come from a cold country, a warm country. You want it to come from people who are experts over millennia, or do you want it from the guy who's opened up the shop in his backyard garage? You tell me, and I'll give you what you want. Well, same thing happens with eggs from women who are opened up and you remove what's in it, and then you make a recipe, and you put it in, and you implant it in a nun. When you look at these programs that they've made from engineering, how can you define what's the actual person or what the system made? How can you differentiate? Do you have a talent? Mm-hmm. Everybody has a talent. Yeah. A talent is a good hint as to what you're good at. You can't become good at something you don't like to do. (laughs) Because you don't practice, you don't try hard enough. But if you're good at something, and it comes naturally to you, you've been programmed for that. I mean, we are now talking about a period in time. Ice Age ended at 8000 B.C., 4,000 years were made in the actual preparation on the earth, so that brings it to 4,000 B.C. When does your Bible start? 4,000 B.C. There's the code book. That's what you do. It shows in there that there is a code that what you're dealing with is 0 to 8, and they call it the top 8-0. 8-0-80. Why 8 Why not 9 Because one batch is going to disappear. Nines. K-9. The mission of nine. Who's the K-9? They call them bitches. Why? Because female dogs are called bitches. K-9. 8 who's the 8 NATO is an 8 Potato is an 8 That's why you have French fries and boiled potatoes in Germany. Everybody can be defined over time based on those things which they most like to do. So, Glenn, what about a jack-of-all-trades? That's what you need for certain occupations. So you make some jack-of-all-trades. You take a whole bunch of -of jack-of-all-trades, and you get their sperm, and you find out what they have in common, and usually it comes down to a lack of attention to detail, but more looking at the big picture, like me. I don't want to spend my time learning what a, an electrician knows or what a plumber knows or what a carpenter knows or what a surgeon knows. No. I want to understand what their purpose is in life. And I want to pick out what I need when I need it and do, even if it's not well done like the experts can do it, Get you through point A to point B. Survive a winter without having hydro know what you're doing. And it comes down to my preparation as a kid. First thing I learned when my mother sent me to the Cubs and Scouts was be prepared. Just because you are what you are today. 
and things are the way they are today. Don't ever take for granted that situation will remain. So start thinking about what if, what if there was no water? What if there was no rain? What if there was no clothes? What if there was no grocery store? And once you got all the what ifs down pat, then you say, okay, what do I do today that I don't need today, but would be handy 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the road if such and such were to happen? The Lou at the Sioux, the floods caused by broken dams, hurricanes. A lot of those things are local now, but in in the old days, a person lived within 20 miles of where he was born. So they didn't know what was beyond the 20 miles. We at least have a general understanding of what we need to survive with water. Do you have a well that you can run a pail down? and pull out some water if you needed to? I doubt it. But everybody who owns a farm should have one. Used to have one. Never maintained it after they got the uh, 125-foot driller come in and put in a, a well that's way underground. But you saw the well. Jared, you cleaned out the place. Now that you don't have electricity, like, what do you do? You get water from it manually? The purpose of everything, Jerd, is what will you have access to if someone denies you access to what you have today? What do you need to survive? The first thing is water. That's something I've I've been thinking about, you know, how things are right now, because that's how I've seen how things have been in my life when I think back. You know, it's like a situation happens, and it's like that for a while, and then it changes, and it's all about me adapting to the new situation. Why do they call orphaned children left at the gate nuns? especially called them foundlings. Is it because they found them? No. It's because they are the foundation to what they're going to do next. The rest that sits on the foundation can come and go. It can disappear. But the foundation is there on which to rebuild. What was the first place occupied by Vikings who came to North America and nobody took any notice of until, what, 20 years ago? They called the place New Found Land, an island in the Atlantic Ocean, they called it. New Found Land. Where did they go to? these explorers who were setting up the system. They went to play football for the Minnesota Vikings while the Washington people wash in ton. A ton is 2,000 pounds. Wash in the 2,000th year. We are now 2017. Within this century, 2,100, two in one, 2,000 to 2,100, there has to be a major change. It says so in the word Washington. And how are they going to do it? They're going to flush them down the drain. How can you flush them down the drain? You have to use water. Where 
where can the water come from? It can come from the sky and it can come from the ocean. And if it comes from the ocean, it's called a tsunami. Ask the Japanese what it felt like. What do you call the equivalent of a tsunami inland? You call it an inland tsunami. And where will it go except to Flushing, New York? It's all written in a coded fashion, and the nuns know the code. Why is it that the people who were sent here, the original people, which today many people call Indians, why do they call them Indians? Because they came from India. Why were those people mistreated by the nuns in residential schools? Why are they finding mass graves at every goddamn nunnery? Ireland is going through a whole search now for all of their monasteries and digging up the backyards and finding thousands and thousands of babies who had, for their purposes, the wrong DNA. So abuse them and kill them and bury them. Why did New York create a district called Harlem? We know there is no L. They tell you every Christmas, no L, no L. Because without an L, Harlem becomes the harem. The harem is the first genetic engineering lab. The pharaoh thinks he's making all these babies himself just because he slept with the girls from the harem. Does a woman get pregnant every time she has sex? No. But can it be made to appear as if a person who had sex then finds that that woman is pregnant if she was artificially inseminated after she left the king or before she entered to see the king? Whatever. Why is it they chose that name for Harlem? Because they're the people who service the ones with the money. They go in and wash their toilets. They go in and feed their children. They go in and change the diapers. And they haven't got a clue they're being used. Let me see that. It's very, very difficult for a human being today, 8,000 years B.C. and 2,000 years since, for 10,000 years, people have been genetically engineered on Earth. Those who didn't have the proper genetics have been murdered by war, pestilence, famine, and disease. Do you think that because we're in the year 2017, the system has changed? Politicians think they're in charge. What can a politician do by himself? Nothing. What does a politician do? He says to the minister, you're responsible for this. Mind you, you never get credit for anything good. You always get the blame for everything bad. Who gets the credit for doing good? The deputy minister. The vice president, he gets elected next. Number two is number one. 10,000 years ago, a process was set in motion by a woman who called herself God, Mother Superior, Mother of the Soup, Superior. And so... Mother Superior will press the button that will cause Lake Superior an inland tsunami which will destroy the wall that contains it called Michigan and the water will flow. 
500 miles wide, 300 miles long, depending on where you call the right, left, and north, and south, and 1,200 feet deep is Lake Superior. And it is fed by hundreds, if not thousands, of water flows. And only 9% flows out of the lake annually. If you double that by removing part of the wall, you probably would have a 40-foot tsunami. And 40 feet of water traveling at the speed of sound is coming across land. Would you want to be in Michigan or Illinois or Ohio or Ontario when the water hits the wall at what is now the St. Lawrence Seaway? St. Lawrence Seaway is 35 feet deep and a mile across. How do you get that water to get out to the ocean if there is a seaway in between that is unable to handle a fraction of the capacity? It goes on land. And, Jerd, you know what isostasy is. Mm-hmm. So when the land underneath the St. Lawrence Seaway starts isostasy to make up for the water by going up, not even what goes in the water into the seaway today can get through except what is going to be above the new height of the St. Lawrence Seaway. All that water is going to flushing New York and it's going to flush everything in between. It's a toilet. Lake Superior is the box that contains the water on the back of the toilet. That water drops down into Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, and Lake Erie. That's the bowl of the toilet. And when it's flushed, it goes over Niagara Falls into Lake Ontario. That's the septic pool. And when the pool on a septic tank is full, it overflows into the green, green grasses of home called the septic field. Well, Ohio is part of the septic field. And Cleveland, Ohio, if you said it in French, le vie, cleave. Le vie, rise in French, rises. Land, there is no L, only DNA. And the water flows down across Ohio and into New York and down to Flushing Meadows. And everything in between is underwater. You know how much... How many, I should say, how many people live in that pathway? What is it? 30, 40, 50, 100 million people. I got a boat tied at my window. Anything that will float. We here are going to rise. The question is, will we rise High enough and fast enough to escape the water, more than likely, because we are north of where the water is going to go. Ogdensburg, New York, is probably going to be an island, and anybody who wants to enter into Canada will go to the border authorities in Ogdensburg in the future because that'll be the clearinghouse. It is the tip of the Canadian Shield. To the east, the Canadian Shield rises to Labrador. To the west, Northwest Territories, Great Slave Lake, a large V-shaped piece of land will rise. Now that we have taken all your time, It's time for me to go do some work. 
<laughs> Have you any question that will gnaw at you for the rest of the week that I can answer if I can before I go? I think Dana has a question. Dana? I had one, but um, it might take a while, so I don't know to answer it. Make sure you uh, tell me in the beginning of a phone call. <laughs> <laughs> Because that's the only way you get an answer. If you're not pissed off at how long it takes to give it, <laughs> remember, we're dealing with 10,000 years or so. We're not dealing with what happened last month or last year or 100 years ago. We're dealing with a project that they set off 42,000 years ago to 24,000 years ago, plus the time since the Ice Age, 10,000. Any event, have a good day. All right. Goodbye. Bye for now. All right, bye. Okay.